very much indeed, uh, Surgeon, for inviting me to talk. It is very, very, um, uh, very kind of you to um, bring me here. Um, in fact, I was last in Ireland three and a half decades ago as a medical student, and I had a wonderful time, actually. Um, I remember the scenery was wonderful, <coughs> and so were the people. And so I know a lot has happened in Ireland in the last three and a half decades, but the scenery and the people remain the same, and it's lovely to come back. So it was quite a long time ago when I had to submit a title for my talk, which at the time I was heavily into genomic sequencing. But actually, I'm a dyed-in-the-wool tissue pathologist. Morphology is my thing, and it has been for those three and a half decades. And so I've sort of watched as a genomic revolution has come to pathology, uh, and I'm interested to know where it will go. I'm going to use as my illustration of this genomic revolution in tissue pathology breast cancer. I think breast cancer has probably been studied the most fully uh, at a genomic le level. It's certainly a very common solid tumour cancer, and it's probably the one that was first analysed the most deeply at a genomic level. But I actually believe we've got as far as we can get with genomic analysis for breast cancer in diagnostic practice. And so, without issuing a spoiler, I think it's back to morphology, and I hope my talk will take you through to that conclusion. So, as I said, a medical student in 1987, so I've seen a lot happening over these last three and a half decades. So, to start to describe how genomics revolutionised breast cancer, I've got to take you to the pre-genomic era, back last century. So, my first slide is really just a summary of the modern history of breast cancer diagnostics. So, back then, last century, we just had morphology classification. It had been going on for many, very many years. We had ductal, lobular, and so on. In 1987, Elston's modification of the Bloom and Richardson grading system came out. It's a fantastic grading system. It's used worldwide, and we still use it today. There was prognostic and predictive ER testing because we did have a targeted therapy, which was tamoxifen. We didn't call it a targeted therapy, we just called it tamoxifen, and the word predictive testing didn't exist. But nonetheless, we were doing prognostic and predictive ER testing. And we knew about HER2, but only just. And actually, what this is here for is just to remind you that back then there was no social media, there was nothing like that, and your most flashiest friend had a 2G cell phone. And actually also, if you were a smart PhD student, this chap called Dion Venter, you could get first author um, articles in Lancet saying overexpression of the CRP2 oncoprotein in human breast carcinomas, immunohistic immunohistological assessment correlates with gene amplification. So we were a one gene at a time society. So that's how we were. And then the revolution came, and I apologize for those in the audience who have seen this slide again and again. It's the heat map taking, taken from Chuck Perot's theater, uh, paper published in, 2000 and, uh, in the year 2000, which revolutionized breast diagnostics. It was beautifully entitled, Molecular Portraits of Human Breast Cancer, and it was also a beautiful paper. But basically, he took about 60 breast cancers, and these are all uh, columns, and by looking at gene expression profiling, <coughs> he decided that you could identify five different types of breast cancer based on its gene expression, uh, luminal A, which were high ER, and PR expresses, luminal B, which also express ER, but had a higher proliferation index, HER2 enriched, which expressed HER2, basal-like, and they didn't express ER, PR, or HER2, but they expressed a lot of basal cytokeratins, and then there was a funny group at the end, which is called normal-like. So that really came with a blast and shook we pathologists out of our comfort zone entirely, and we had to talk molecular. 
The thing is, um, that was all on gene expression profiling. And well, currently, I work in the western suburbs of Sydney, and we just cannot afford gene expression profiling on all our cancers, or, or certainly not our breast cancers. <laughs> Um, the western suburbs of Sydney, I don't know if anyone has ever gone there, but it's not where Nicole Kidman has her flat. <laughs> so anyway, so we had to do something cheap and rapid and diagnostic. Um, so it was quite good because we did have ERPR and HER2 IHC and key 67 for, um, gene, uh, for um, proliferation marker. And therefore, we got, uh, we could do ERP on HER2. That fitted with the luminal, luminal B, HER2 enriched, and everything else was triple negative. We didn't care. We didn't have targeted therapies. Who cared? They were triple negative. We had no other probes we could use. We had no targeted therapy. So they were just triple negative. And there, uh, we, we rested for a while diagnostically. And what then happened, therefore, that the gene expression profiling basal type breast cancers and triple negative became clinically synonymous. However, our molecular uh, biology colleagues didn't leave the triple negative group there. And so over the years, there's been a lot of investigation of these triple negative breast cancers. So in other words, um, groups have applied ER, PR, and HER2 IHC. If they're triple negative, then they have looked further at the genome of these cancers. And in fact, this particular group, Lerman et al., he decided that there were in fact six different types of triple negative breast cancers. You can see there's two basal-like, BL1, BL2, he declared there was an immune modulatory group, there were two mesenchymal or mesenchymal stem cell, and there was this luminal androgen receptor. So in fact, triple negative is much more complicated than we think. However, does it really matter, given that there is no targeted therapies, they all get chemotherapy? Well, I hope to tell you that it does actually matter. because. With all the investigation at the genetic level, what people could, of course, then do is define specific targeted therapies for triple negative breast cancer. And this paper was published in uh, 2007 in Pharmacogenomics. And it basically summarizes, now that we understand all the different types, molecularly speaking, of triple negative breast cancer, people can devise um, targeted therapies for them. Uh, that was a bit complicated, that slide, for me. This is much, I can, I can work with this. So this is identical to the previous slide I've shown you, except by another group. They say, if by gene expression profiling, we can break triple negative breast cancers into basal-like, mesenchymal-like, immune-modulated, and new luminal androgen receptor, then we can devise specific targeted therapies for those different groups. So that's, again, all very well, but that brings me back to Western cities, Sydney suburbs, no money, we don't have gene expression profiling. But just to put that to one side, when I said in my introduction that I think we've gone as far as we can usefully get with genomics in breast cancer, this is because if you, I appreciate the fact that we've now got potential targeted therapies, which has come out of all the genetic investigation. But now what is happening, people are producing more papers with, for instance, more subdivisions of triple negative breast cancer. So this group, and it's published <coughs> in Nature, said there's 10 integrated types of breast cancer now. Now I know if I go to my MDT and t start to tell them about its type one, two, three, seven, nine integrated breast cancer types, they will, eyes will glaze over, and then, as usual, they'll start talking over me, and I'll be left bereft. So they're just not interested clinically about these. What, why that is so is because if you go back to Chuck Perot's paper, if you see, like, the blue duo here, they, that is a primary and a met from the same patient. 
The point being, the more you look and the more you separate by gene expression profile, you can go right down to individual people. So that doesn't really become useful for a, a therapy point of view. So I don't think that going further down in the genome helps us because we just don't have any therapy to match that degree of investigation. Equally, you can do other things if you want to look further in the gene expression profiling or the genomics of breast cancer. So this particular group actually decided they wanted to have four different types of triple negative breast cancer. They compared their four types with the original Chuck Perot's types or the Lerman type, and they don't all fit together. That's important because sometimes people criticize morphology because some cancers are not easily to fit in certain morphological groups. But if you look very hard at genomic data, it's exactly the same. If you want to categorize on a genomic basis, you run in the same problems that some cancers are not easily classified. And then furthermore, what's been happening since the gene expression profiling <coughs> is this group, Learman, who produced those six transcriptome types. He's now decided to get rid of his immune modulatory type and also his mesenchymal stem cell type because his group has decided that those expression profiles were actually due to, in the immune modulatory um, group, that was due to the tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. And the group doesn't want to know about tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. This uh, was removed because he decided that the um, profile was due to the stroma and this group doesn't want to know about the stroma and I'm holding my head because I know day to day, clinically, everyone wants to know about tumour infiltrating lymphocytes and stroma. So this is what I mean whereby just looking at the genome has gone a little bit too far in breast cancer. We want, need to get more holistic again. Um, so now it's the ascendancy of immunogenomics. And there's this paper here published in Nature Reviews, Haku et al., who made the statement that if you just look at the geno genome of the cancer cells and you apply targeted therapies to that, then they do mutate and they actually become resistant in quite short time frame. Whereas they were suggesting that as tumor cells shed antigens, the uh, immune system is adaptable, and so you can have this adaptability in immunotherapy. So the suggestion was, I don't think to replace the targeted therapies of the tumor mutations, but to actually use those alongside immunomodulatory therapy. So that's another reason why we mustn't get rid of the stroma the analysis of the stroma or the lymphocytes. Uh, now this very complicated paper, I don't want to go into, but again on immunomodulatory therapy, if I was looking at this, uh, a tumor diagnostically, I would have to consider the HLA type of the patient, the mutations at the, at the DNA level, the expression of the mutations, and use databases to understand how immunogenic those neoantigens were, are. And so my point is that it's getting awfully complicated out there in the diagnostic setting. And can we just get back to basics? Think of the patient in front of us. Think of the pot of money that we have to spend on those patients. And how can we manage that? Well, getting back to the here and now, and back to my fact that I have people coming, I have biopsies from women with triple negative breast cancer, and how can we manage them in the here and now? Well, fortunately, although I say that we don't have money for gene expression profiling, the pathologists can help. We, we pathologists can recognize those different types of triple negative breast cancer down the microscope. So this is a paper published way back in 2009 by the Nottingham Group describing the morphological features of one of those types of triple negative breast cancer, the basal type, it's the mo most common type. And I know by experience not to tell you all the morphological features because you'll all start to fall asleep, but I, 
I, I promise you that as, as you, if you are a pathologist, you can recognize this type of breast cancer as a basal-like breast cancer. So this would be um, amenable to PARP inhibitors, for instance. This next type, I would posit, is a mesenchymal type breast cancer if you were to array it. The array expression of um, this mesenchymal group uh, talk about an epithelial to mesenchymal transition. Well, look, we can see it in front of our eyes, epithelial to mesenchymal tra transition. So we can see these different types of breast cancer down the microscope. Equally, this is an androgen receptor. Uh, this will probably be a luminal androgen receptor type on expression arrays. I recognize these all the time. They look a bit like HER2 positive breast cancers. They have a lot of apocrine features. So this one, I slapped on my androgen receptor immunohistochemistry. It's positive. This could potentially be treated with anti-androgen therapies. And lastly, this is the immune modulatory one that Learman and all wants to get rid of. This actually looks like a basal breast cancer, but it's got a sea of um, lymphocytes around it. So this would be great for immune modulatory uh, therapy. And in fact, it's been shown in uh, clinical trials that that actually does happen. If you have a high tumor infiltrating lymphocyte uh, load, then you do tend to uh, respond very well for the immunotherapies for triple negative breast cancer. Um, I'm sorry, I skipped this slide. One more caveat now. If we have um, targeted therapies for triple negative breast cancer, we really do have to modify our definition of what is triple negative in that currently, if a breast cancer expresses only a very small amount of ER positivity, more than 1%, it is not triple negative, it is ER positive. But we, can, we pathologists see tumours like this, which looks like morphologically a basal type breast cancer, but unfortunately there's a little bit of ER positivity. And by the ASCO CAP guidelines, that's not a triple negative breast cancer. That's absolutely silly, because what that means is you're using a, sim a single parameter to overthrow everything else that you know about that cancer. And in fact, when I, on this particular case, which was one of my cases, when I did basal type immunomarkers, they all shone up. This is a basal type breast cancer, which is spuriously expressing a little bit of ER positivity. So we must not actually just stick to single molecular anal analytes to define our breast cancers. Uh, this just shows that the gene, uh, gene, on gene expression, no, sorry, this just shows that they've now found that low ER expressing <coughs> breast cancers have a poor response to hormone therapy, which is not really surprising, and indeed their genome profiles are more similar to basal-like breast cancers. In other words, the morphology tells you much more than the immunohistochemistry. So where do we go from here? And this is where I think, with all that complication of investigation, the investigation of the immune system, the interplay of the immune system with the tumor, the genetics of the tumor, this is where I think we need to come back to morphology. And I think, though, we need help from artificial intelligence, and we need help with our morphology. But we want to extract the big data that I see every day as a pathologist. Um, so this is a lovely paper, and I like the title, Precision, on Precision Histology, How Deep Learning is Poised to Revitalize Histomorphology for Plasmide Cancer Care. And that absolutely spoke to me. It's a lovely paper, and it shows that the details not apparent to the human observer may be identified by AI, which can aid us. Um, it can actually identify features which we haven't to date noted as important, and it also can be um, a sort of surrogate for genetic testing which will take longer to put patients on therapy more quickly. So basically this paper was saying that if we t extract big data and use artificial intelligence, it can help us to enhance our morphological definitions and our morphological classification. 
There are more papers like that, and I've just got an example here. This one suggesting that uh, quantitative image analysis of cellular heterogeneity in breast tumour complements genomic profiles. It showed that spatial arrangement of the tumour infiltrating <coughs> cells to the stroma is important for prognosis, and this also showed that, in fact, which I'm sure you would all be aware, that the, um, the uh, computer was better at accessing and quantifying tumour infiltrating lymphocytes than the poor old pathologist. That's just because we get bored with doing that. There's another paper, and I can show you many papers. This again showing that stromal features was important for the prognosis of that breast cancer. And if you read a textbook on breast cancer, you will not read about stromal features. So this is where artificial intelligence, uh, digital analysis is going to really help us with uh, defining different types of breast cancer. So I am, in fact, so excited by this uh, artificial intelligence that uh, uh, we've instigated a research uh, project. Uh, we have got access to the Australian Breast Cancer Tissue Bank, which has got over 500 digitally imaged um, triple negative breast cancers with prognosis, treatment, outcome data. Um, and in fact, I've uh, teamed up with Professor Nasir Rajput, who is a computer scientist from the University of Warwick, um, and he is going to help me uh, look at these triple negative breast cancers. And at that point, I have to thank Sirden for that, because I met Professor Rajput through um, David Sneed, and I was introduced to David Sneed by Dion Venter. And Dion Venter met David Sneed at the Sirden conference two years ago. So thank you for that. Uh, it's funny how things happen. So I think, in the end, we, we are poised to learn more about breast cancers, not from further omics, be it methyl omics, proteomics, genomics, transcriptomics, but by looking at the endpoint of all those omics, which is the morphology. We've done quite well up to now as pathologists, but we really need assistance now from the people who digital image and can work with big data on um, images, and that's where we want to go, I believe. So rebranding. I'm going to rebrand my department. It's not going to be tissue pathology. We are going to be the department of morphologics. So thank you.